from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 11th chapter of Matthew. The 11th chapter of Matthew. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to speak tonight on the university of life. I want to speak to young people as well as older people on the subject of the university of life. Now, we usually think of this text that a pastor will take and use at Labor Day, but that's wrong in one sense, and yet in another sense it is correct. But this is an invitation to men and women who are exhausted with the search for truth. Jesus said, you've been searching for truth, you're tired. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You found it. The search ends with me. Now, at this university we're talking about tonight, you can fail, but you can never drop out. All over the world, people are beginning to ask questions about where civilization is headed. One of the foreign experts left Washington in, his, in despair this past summer and went back to the university to teach, and he was asked why. And he said, sometimes I get the feeling I'm sitting on a hilltop watching two trains racing toward each other on the same track. Vice Premier Deng of China stated recently, this past summer, that World War III is inevitable and independent of man's will in this decade. A British editorial said recently, the world is on a collision course with disaster. Now, when we come back to America and see the affluence of America, I also read and hear about the new surge of problems that our affluency has created. Psychologists, economists, clergy, politicians are dealing with social and moral problems on a scale that they've never had to deal with before. For example, the marriage breakups, even among so-called professing Christians, some of them well-known Christians in our newspapers even today. Married women having adulterous affairs has tripled in the last five years, but the price they pay is escalating drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. Racial tensions, we thought the race problem in America was settled. It's not settled. Look at Miami or Philadelphia this past summer. The psalmist said, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and rest. Have you ever felt that way? You'd like to fly away from life and rest. You'd like to get out of that kitchen and rest. You'd like to get out of that job and rest. You'd like to fly away somewhere. Thousands of people out east come to Nevada and to California thinking that they're going to find it here. And they may find something here, but they find wonderful air here in Reno, I'll tell you that. They find beautiful mountains here. And they find a lot of activity here. But the real thing they're searching for is God because, you see, they were made in the image of God. And without God, their hearts are restless till they come to know God. You can never find true rest until you know God. And you that are watching by television, if you want to find peace with God and rest in your own souls, call that number on your screen right now and let somebody talk to you, as many people here will do later on in the evening. You see, the psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of the world today. The psalmist also said, I'm full of heaviness and looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. The Bible also says, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. No way out. Jesus said, I am the way out. He said, there's only one way to escape, one way out, and I'm it. You have to come by the way of the cross and the empty tomb and find reconciliation with God and peace in your heart and joy in your heart that you have lost. And how many of you are trying to escape? You've come out here from somewhere else to escape all the rigors of life somewhere else, but you haven't really found it yet. You haven't found that joy and that peace that you thought you'd find or that sense of fulfillment. You don't have the answer to the questions, where did you come from? What is life all about? Where are you going when you die? You don't have those answers yet. You can find it tonight by coming to Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said, 
learn of me. It's a picture of Jesus Christ as the great professor at the university. He's the greatest teacher that ever was. The Bible says he taught them as one having authority. He spoke with authority. You never find Jesus saying, I hope this is the way. I think this is the way. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There are many ways in life that seem right, but the end is death, destruction, judgment, and hell. And Jesus warned about that. Jesus said, I am the way. Now, most of the world would agree that he's the greatest teacher that ever lived. And so tonight, I want you to sit for a few moments at the feet of the world's greatest teacher. In most American universities and colleges, they have what is called required courses and elective courses. Now, in life, there are certain required courses. What are they? There are three, three required courses and three elective courses that I want you to think about tonight. The first required course is life itself. Philosophy means the study of life and ideas concerning life. And one of the most discussed new books published last summer was The Philosophers, in which 20 of the most influential philosophers of the Western world in modern times are psychoanalyzed as to the amount of fulfillment that they themselves enjoy. And it, it, so demon, it demonstrated that all 20 of them that they studied were characterized by loneliness and anxiety. You see, we did not choose to be born. We were not consulted about living. And there's nothing you can do to stop living. We did not choose where to be born. We did not choose what color of skin we have. There's no escaping life. Oh, you say, I can commit suicide. That doesn't get you out of life. You only kill the body. Your soul, your spirit is eternal. It lives on. So you cannot escape by suicide. Suicide does not end at all, as some people think. Yes, you're required to live. How do you face life? What resources do you have to call upon when the pressures get great and the crisis comes and the difficulties come? What do you have to call upon? Well, if you know Jesus Christ, you don't have anything to worry about because when he lives in your heart, he gives great inward peace and joy and assurance and a sense of safety and well-being when you come to Christ. It affects you physically and mentally and socially. Every way, every phase of your life is affected when Christ dominates your life because you let him come as Savior as well as Lord. And then the second required course that you have at the university, you're required to die. Now, we have been having a lot of studies on death lately. We read about Dr. Kubler-Ross and Dr. Rawlings and Dr. Moody and others and courses on thanatology in our universities are springing up all over the country teaching people about death and the classrooms are filled with students studying death. George Bernard Shaw said that there's one statistic that we can be sure of. Now, everybody in the gaming business here in Nevada ought to hear this. The odds against which no gambler can win, that one out of every one dies. Now, that's a sure thing. God said to Hezekiah, thou shalt die and not live. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. The number of years is simply relative. The fact is we all die. And the Bible says there's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed for your death. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow morning. There's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed. The Bible says in Job 14, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds beyond which he cannot pass. There's a moment beyond which you cannot live already appointed. And God is giving you this moment of grace right now to find Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's the reason the Bible always says today, 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 harden not your heart. Now is the accepted time of salvation. The Bible is saying don't put it off. Tomorrow is the devil's word. Come while you can. There's only one man in history that didn't have to die, and that was Jesus Christ. 
He said, no man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He was perfect. He was free from sin and its effects, and yet he died on the cross. Why? Because he died for you. He took the things that caused death in your life on the cross in your place. He died for you. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now tonight, you come to that cross and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and God says, forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I forgive you. I write your name in the book of life. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But not only did he die, he rose again. He's alive tonight, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. I haven't seen the picture, the raising of the Titanic, but I've read about it. And they're going to try to raise it next summer. And that's going to be a very interesting experiment. They're doing a similar thing off the coast of Japan where they found a, a Russian ship and they think it may have $30 billion worth of gold in it, and they're after that gold. And it's going to be quite interesting to see who gets it when they finally get it all up. And uh, so there is a great deal of raising going on, but the Bible says there's coming a time when there's going to be a general resurrection, when all of those that are lost are going to be raised, and all of those that are saved are going to be raised. And Jesus Christ died on our account on the cross was raised again and that is living proof he is living proof tonight that there's going to be a resurrection someday think of it jesus christ came back from the dead to tell us there's more because he lives i can face tomorrow the bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death are you ready and then the third thing in this school that is required of you the judgment of God is required. You're going to face the judgment. There's a movie out called The Judgment, and someday you're going to give a moral accounting. The searching eyes of God will miss nothing in that day when you stand before him. Now, the whole country's talking about who shot J.R. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly who did it. A sinner. And someday, all the Ewing family and all the suspects are going to have to stand before God, just like you are. And every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment, the Bible says. Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and Lord, we've done all these great things in your name. But the Bible says God is, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, you can be in the church. Last night, a number of Catholic people came forward and Episcopalian people and people who have confirmation. I was confirmed myself when I was about 12 years of age in a, an associate reformed Presbyterian church. And I know what they meant when they came. They wanted to reconfirm their confirmation. What had they promised God in accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And how many of you tonight need Christ? You need to come to him. You've been away from him. You're in the church. Your name is on the church roll, but you really don't know Christ. More than a third of the people that have been coming forward here to receive Christ have no church connections but nearly two-thirds do. Some of them are back east, and they haven't thought about the church since they've been in Reno or in Nevada or in Northern California or wherever you may be. Come to Christ tonight and receive him into your heart and start all over again. Now, those are the required courses. Life itself, you cannot be unborn. You're required to die. You're required to face the judgment. Now, there are certain options at the university tonight, the University of Life. First, you can choose your way of life. The Bible says, choose you this day. As I said a moment ago, there is a way that seemeth right. Now, some of those roads that seem right, 
There's the lust of the eye the Bible talks about. Possessions. It seems that to gain all the possessions you can, there's nothing wrong with that, it seems. Things are not wrong, but when your life is centered in the acquisition of physical possessions, then the lust of the eyes has gotten the best of you. And that's sin. And it seems right, but it's wrong. And it leads to a dead end. Then there's the lust of the flesh. Those are the physical things which offer by way of luxury and entertainment. Some of us are selling our souls for sinful pleasure. Overeating, the wrong use of sex, excessive use of alcohol, all of these things. The Scripture says the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Then there's also the pride of life. That seems right. Ego, position, getting the best. Self-interest, but that's a wrong road. We ought to think something of ourselves. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to love ourselves because you cannot love your neighbor. You cannot be a true Christian without having a respect for yourself. And there's a certain love of self, but not this egocentric thing because the very heart of sin is selfishness. The very heart of sin is ego. And when you come to Christ, your ego has to be surrendered to Christ until he becomes law. And then secondly, not only can you choose your way of life, but you can choose who will be the master of your life. What's going to master your life? What philosophy are you giving your life to? What group are you giving your life to? Who is going to control you? Are you going to control your own life and make a wreck of it? Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. By nature, we want to run our own lives. We think we know better than even God knows. But God has a plan for your life, and his plan is perfect. For every young person here, God has a plan. He has the right person picked out for you to marry if you'd only trust him to help you. He has the right job for you, the right vocation for you. It's all planned. If you'll say, Lord, thy will be done, and you surrender to him and let him become involved in all the affairs of your life. Or some of you that are already married, or maybe you're older now, and your life is all messed up. Did you know that God can rearrange your life after you've messed it up by forgiving your sin? Now, he can't take those scars away of sin. I've watched people come forward here and I've seen many of them as they stood in front of this platform night after night. I've seen them with sin-scarred faces because sin leaves its mark. But God can forgive all that and he can take all that mess that you've made in your life and straighten it all out and get you back on the right road if you'll trust him. You say, well, Billy, suppose I've been divorced in my remarried and my life is all what what'll happen well you can't unscramble eggs but you can start from where you are by trusting Christ where you are he'll forgive the past and give you a whole new spiritual life and give you a power beyond anything you ever dreamed and a love and a joy and a peace don't let the devil worry you about past sins once you've been to the cross if your son asks for bread will you give him a snake no, God loves you. He has a plan for you. And you ask for something good, he's not going to give you a snake, says the Scripture, said Jesus. The rich young ruler, the problem with him was not his wealth, but he wanted to control his own life. And many of you want to control your own life. You see, we want to run our own lives. Suppose I'd go up in the airliner and tell the pilot, I want to pilot this plane. I've never piloted a plane in my life. I can take over from you. No. God says, get up out of that seat. You're making a wreck of your life. You're heading toward destruction. Let me take the controls of your life. I've been over the road before. Let me help you. And then lastly, you can choose your own destination. The destination is heaven or hell. 
The Bible says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. What are we to do? What can you do tonight to make your peace with God? The Bible says, prepare to meet God. Well, how do you prepare? First, by repentance. Repentance means that you're willing to let God change your life. It means that you change your mind so much that it changes the way you live. And you're willing to give up all those things that are sinful in your life and turn over to Jesus Christ, your life. The second thing, you come by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, says the Bible. Just believe. You say, well, there must be a catch somewhere. There is. That word believe means that you put your total confidence in. You don't put your confidence in your own works. You don't put your confidence in anything but the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. You cannot work your way. You cannot pay your way. You come by simple childlike faith. And then the third thing, you must be willing to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. Earlier in the year, it was my privilege to hold a 10-day mission at Cambridge University in England, as well as Oxford University. And I could not help but remember that young man at Cambridge who made this statement when he gave his life to Christ. He was the son of a very wealthy man, and he was one of the greatest cricketers that Cambridge has ever had. He said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice that I can make for him can be too great. That was C.T. Studd who said that. And he went out as a missionary with the Cambridge Seven that started a whole missionary movement at the end of the last century. Jim Elliott, who was killed by the Orca Indians in South America as a young student, wrote this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I ask you, young and old alike tonight, do you know Christ? Is he your Lord and your Savior? In a few moments, I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform as we saw over 500 last night do and stand here and say, by coming symbolically, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to forgive my sins and change my life. I want to know where I'm going. I want to know what life is all about, and I want fulfillment in my life. I ask you to come publicly because every person Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. I ask you to come publicly because there's a psychological and a biblical reason for you to come. You stand here a moment, and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and then give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. There's something about coming forward like that that settles it and seals it. You that are in the other auditorium where we were a moment ago, where thousands of people are gathered, you come forward in your auditorium where you are. Grady Wilson will be there to say a word and to help you, and many counselors are there as well. And then you that are watching by television, you pick up the phone right now and call the number on your screen. Don't let this moment pass because there may never be another moment quite like this in your life when you're so close to the kingdom of God and all it needs is a, is a phone call to talk to someone. And then if you don't get through immediately, wait a moment or two and call again. Wait five minutes or ten minutes, call again. But don't let this night pass. Those people, some of them will be there for several hours to answer your phone. You get up and come right here as people are making their decisions here and in the other auditorium and all over America right now. You join them and come and stand here and say yes to Christ. We're going to wait on you. You may be in the choir. You may be a leader in the church, or you may not have any church connections. Whoever you are, God has spoken to you. Get up and come. We're going to wait on you. You that are watching by television can see that many scores of people, I suppose hundreds of people, are coming to make this commitment here in Reno, Nevada. You can make that same commitment right now where you are. Just pick up the phone and call that number that's on your screen and have a talk with that counselor and tell them what you want to do. Or make the decision right where you are. Maybe your circumstances are such you cannot call right now. All right, make your commitment now. Bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. 
from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you. I want you to turn with me tonight to the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel and the 24th verse. The sixth chapter and the 24th verse. These words, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to make a choice. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. You know, there's a psychological vacuum in America tonight. Millions have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. They want a cause to believe in. They want a song to sing and they want a flag to follow. Ernest Hemingway once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug into. Irvin S. Cobb once said, in politics, I'm a Democrat. In religion, I'm an innocent bystander. I remember a story that they used to tell out of the American Civil War. One man said, I'm neutral. So he put on gray trousers and a blue coat and they shot at him from both sides. <laughs> Christ never allowed people to be bystanders and spectators. The word Christian is from the Latin and it literally means partisan for Christ, a partisan for Christ. You know, they're having all that trouble down in Yugoslavia and Mr. Tito died some time ago and left a vacuum in that country and his people that followed him in fighting the Nazis during the war were called partisans. I I'm old enough to remember that myself. And they were called partisans and they committed themselves. They believed in something. And those partisans never play at neutral. They never play at safe. They never sit on the fence. They are never spectators in the struggle of their times. They take sides. They commit themselves. I heard one in Texas, they asked this man, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian in the early days was used in derision. It was a term of reproach. Many people have a wrong idea about what a Christian is. They think that a Christian is a person who prays, who lives by the golden rule, who is sincere, who goes to church, and who keeps the Ten Commandments. All those are good things. They're products many times of being a Christian, but that doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't really make you a true follower of Jesus Christ. A Christian is one that three things has taken place in his life. First, he has made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice and it affected the whole human race because they sinned against God and that became a disease that went from generation to generation and you and I have a disease that's going to end in physical death and spiritual death unless we, return, unless we turn to Christ. Every choice we make affects other people. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, 30th chapter, Moses called upon the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose. Joshua, the 24th chapter, Joshua said to the people, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I'm asking you tonight to make a choice. You have, many of you have a choice to make. I talked to a man on the telephone this afternoon and I asked him straight out, will you receive Christ as Savior? He said, not now, I'm going to think it over. I have too many questions to ask. And he made a choice, but he said, I'll watch on television and I'm praying that he'll make the right choice. In 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, Elijah said to all the people, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord God be God, follow him. If the devil is God, serve him. 
Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Think of it. Jesus said it's a narrow gate, it's a narrow road for eternal life, and only a few people are going to find it. Most of the people are going to be on the broad road that leads to destruction and judgment and hell. Which road are you on tonight? You have to make that choice before you leave here. And then secondly, a Christian is a person who has made a change, a change in the way you live. The Holy Spirit comes into your life when you receive Christ and He gives you the power to change your whole way of life. The Scripture says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your mind, your emotions, your will are all involved in that change, and it affects your whole life when you come to Christ. Many people have made statements about this very thing. Freud said people change by renewing their fixations. Adler, the great psychiatrist, used to say, people change by renewing their goals. Rollo May used to say they change by renewing their efforts towards self-realization. But God says people change by renewing their minds. The Bible has a lot to say about the mind. When you come to Jesus Christ, you don't commit intellectual suicide. You come to Christ with your mind and you change your mind, and that's repentance. You change your mind toward God. You change your mind toward sin. You change your mind toward yourself, and you change your mind toward your neighbor, and you begin to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible is very clear. To change from a defeated, problem-oriented person depends on first changing the mind because our problems, emotional upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in Christ. The third thing, a Christian is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many of you are looking for a challenge? If any man will come after me, the first thing he must do is deny self your own selfish ambitions, your own self-goals, and you must come to the cross where Christ died for you and shed His blood. Because you see, you and I are sinners. We've all broken God's law and we deserve judgment. We deserve hell. We're going to end up in hell. We're going to end up at the judgment. But Christ came on the cross and by his stripes we are healed. When they took those long leather thongs with steel pellets and beat him across the back, he was doing that for you. When they put those nails in his hands, he was doing it for you. When they put that spear in his side, he was doing it for you. He went to hell for you. He took your judgment and your hell so that you'll never have to spend one minute in hell and you'll never have to face the great judgment of God. That's how much God loves you. God loves you. But he rose again. We don't worship a Christ who's still on a cross. We worship a living Christ. That's what Easter is all about. But God says that if you're to follow him, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. Every morning when you get up, you take up your cross. Now, what is your cross? The cross is the fact that Jesus went out to die on the cross. It was like saying, take up the electric chair and follow me today. Take up the gallows and follow me. You identify yourself with Christ openly and publicly, and you're not ashamed of Christ. That's what it means. He would walk down the street and people, and he would call men and they would follow him. Now, some young people here tonight resist the idea of choice of any sort. We've been called the generation of the uncommitted. You don't want, you, they don't want to be called narrow. They don't want to close their minds. 
Christ taught clearly that there are two roads, two masters, and two destinies. We cannot travel both roads, so we avoid the choice as long as we can. There's death in every choice. You die to one road when you go down the other. Life never allows neutrality without exacting a price. Try to be neutral in politics, and one day you'll be confronted with the ballot box. Try to be neutral about the race problem, and it'll, you'll be confronted in your block, in your neighborhood, or on your street, or in your school. And someday, it will come to you. You can't be non-involved in the issues of our day and the social problems of our day. You can't be involved with the thousands of people that walk the streets of King County with no place to sleep and nothing and very little to eat. We have to do something about it. That's the reason we have love and action. We know we can't feed all the hungry people, but we do it as an example as to what churches ought to be doing all the time. We ought to be extending a helping hand to help all of those that are in need. Some people don't want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. There's a time, though, when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus Christ demands that you decide, decide about him. Pilate asked, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. You have to make a decision about Christ. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, some are reluctant to make the choice for Christ because of theology. Uh, you don't want to accept uh, all the things that the Scripture teaches about God and about Christ, even about God Himself. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says, God is a God of love. And then there comes the Bible. What am I going to do about the Bible? I can't accept the Bible. Job says, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. I don't ever spend five minutes wondering whether this is the Word of God or not. I accepted this by faith years ago, and I've never had a doubt about it since. When you accept it by faith, nothing can move you. There are things I don't understand in the Bible. There are things that are almost apparent contradictions, but they're not. I just accept it as God's Word by faith. My problem is not the things I don't understand in the Bible, it's the things I do understand. Things that I do understand that I ought to be doing in obedience to Christ. That's what disturbs me. And then there are a lot of young people that say, well, I've heard about conversion and you want us to be converted? Yes, because Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you can't see the kingdom of God. What does conversion mean? It just means turn around. I'm going this direction. I turn and I start this direction in my life. That's conversion. Just changing over. That's all it means. Don't make a big thing out of it. But it is a big thing because it depends, your eternity depends on whether you've been really converted or not. You have to be converted inside, in your heart, not just the outward things. Many people think you're a good person because you go to church, you've been baptized, or maybe you've been confirmed in your church. But you need to come and reconfirm your confirmation vows. You need to come and reconfirm the baptism vows that you took or the baptism vows that your parents took. You need to come and make Christ real in your own life. And then some refuse Christ because of the church. How many times I hear the word, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there's hypocrites in every area of life. I was born and reared on a dairy farm and we sold milk and we would distribute the milk to the various customers and we'd get up early in the morning and uh, send our little dairy trucks out and I would milk the cows and sometimes I'd go on the truck. And uh, we had several dairies in our area and so the, when 
price of milk got so low, the farmers began to put water in the milk. Now, they were hypocrites in the milk business, but that did not mean that they were not some real ones. My father would never stoop to such a thing as that. Now, the one requirement for membership in the church is that you are unworthy to be a member. Christ himself founded the church. The church is made up of sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. There's no such thing as a perfect church. If you find a perfect church and you join it, it becomes imperfect. The church is for fellowship. The church is for strengthening our faith. The church has many things that it can contribute to you. But there's another reason that we sometimes say we don't want to come to Christ. We don't want to pay the price. If you want an education, you'll deny anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of things to attain it. Now, God gave the very best he had for you. The scripture says he spared not his own son. The scripture says the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then there are other young people that are afraid of being misunderstood and ridiculed, do not want to be in such a small minority. The Bible teaches that there may be persecution. There will be. You will be misunderstood. You will be an outsider in many groups. In, and peer pressure is so powerful today in the various school levels, whether it's the university or whether it's the high school. The Bible teaches that you may be an outsider and you may have to seek some new friends because one of the things that happens is when you come to Christ, you enter a whole new social world and you will find that you will have brothers and sisters in every country of the world. It's a great fraternity that we join when we come to Christ. And it may not be just Episcopalians or Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostalist or Presbyterians or Catholic. It may be we just are Christ ones. I've been all over, the, well, not all over the world, but many parts of the world, and I've met people that were absolute strangers to me, but the moment we met, we were brothers. You might not be invited to certain parties. You might not be invited to certain things, and you may have to pay a price for a little while till you make new friends among believers. To follow Christ may be costly business, but the Apostle Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a part of the cost. It's not easy to follow Christ in 1991 in America. It's hard. It costs something. And then there are many young people that just put it off. You say, I'm going to wait till another time. Proverbs 27 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day will bring forth. The scripture says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Lillian Roth's story in her book, I'll Cry Tomorrow, at a certain point she had this to say, I'm an alcoholic and I need help. You need to say tonight, I have sinned against God and I need help. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to be sure if I died now that I would go straight into heaven. Will you say that tonight? And if you're not certain of your relationship to Christ tonight, I'm going to ask you to make sure so that you can leave here and say, I know that Christ lives inside of me. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to get up out of your seat and say that. You must make that commitment. Don't sit on the fence any longer. Just stand out and say, I'm coming. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died saw that we were going to be in Sheffield, England for a crusade. And he said, I don't know anything about God, but I ought to hear that man. So he came. He did, and he accepted Christ, and he told his counselor, I almost died without faith. When we win 
one of the places, I forget, some city, there was a 16-year-old girl that gave her life to Christ, and the next night she found her counsel and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight, and we were reconciled. George Williams, who founded the YMCA, came to Christ in the 19th century in England's West Country, and he wrote this, I cannot describe to you the joy and the peace which flowed into my soul when first I saw that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins and that they were all forgiven. Do you know Christ? Are you certain of it? If there's a doubt in your heart and mind, make sure tonight. I read the life story some years ago of Francisco Pizarro. It brought back to mind today when I was reading about the trouble they're having in Peru. In the 16th century, he conquered Peru. In the midst of great difficulties, when he only had a handful of men left, he drew a line with his sword on the ground. One way was to Peru with riches and danger, and the other was back toward Panama where their ships were and security. He chose to march south to Peru and became the founder of that great nation. Tonight, you stand at the crossroads of your life. You step across that line that has been drawn in the sand by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, repent of your sin. Be converted. Come to me. I will change your life. I'll make you a new person. I'll give you new power, a new joy, a new peace, a new happiness. I'm going to ask you to come. And by coming, you are saying, I open my heart and give my life to Christ. I want a change in my life. Get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave, please. I want to say a word to you that have been watching by television. You have been here in Seattle, Washington with us in this great kingdom, one of the great stadiums of the world. And we've seen hundreds of people come to Christ tonight, simply not knowing all about it, but coming to offer themselves to Jesus Christ and praying and hoping that there'll be a change in their lives.